Oops, oops, grab the dog. Rue probably doesn't. We are ready to start. I'm thinking it's Monday, but it's actually Tuesday. So if it was Monday, these guys would be uh, doing stuff, and Hannah would also be here. But uh, it's Tuesday. We have a guest uh, puppy in class, Roo, R-O-O, -O, yellow lab, 12 weeks old, I guess 12. Um, anything you want to tell us about Roo, Rachel, any, um, yeah, anything you want to tell us history-wise, any, you know, puppies are interesting because I've got a couple 11-week-old Border collies, they came with fleas. That means they probably came with tape ones. And the other day, I should show you a little film. They have little, you know, those little rice things in the poop. You guys seen those? If you watch them, I actually have a movie on my camera. They stretch out. And then, so I've got to call Brittany this afternoon. And because uh, they, you know, we gave them something to, and the fecals were negative. That's the kicker. The fecals were negative. So then about nine days ago, so then I see this this weekend. So maybe the, the early infestation that hadn't been shed yet, or I don't know what, right? We'll check it out. Anything you want to say? Okay, she'll get the marathon. Okay, emotional support animal. Okay. Yeah. She's fresh, 12 weeks old. Um, where is she at in her puppy shots? Do you know? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's always, uh, if you talk to animal uh, dog breeders, this thing about puppy vaccination is, is crazy because uh, sometimes they fail, the vaccinations fail, and one of the main reasons they fail is because the mom's antibodies are floating around, and when they, from the milk, right, and a little bit prenatal too, we'll get to this when we do immunology, when you give a dog a vaccine, it's actually an antigen of you know, whatever. And if mom has the antibodies against those, and they're, they're pretty high titer, it's called, then the antibodies attach to the vaccine, and the immune system, the full <coughs> immune system, doesn't get a good exposure to the vaccine. Okay? So the number one reason why vaccines fail in young animals is the presence of mom's antibodies. Now, that's not a bad thing. Mom's antibodies are good. But if they are still too high, when you vaccinate, sometimes the vaccines aren't effective and it gets messy. So some breeders want a tighter done on puppies. And they don't vaccinate them until a certain level falls down, a tighter level falls down. It's complicated. My puppies are just went through their first, they came right off the farm. I mean, they were, there are fleas because of the animal density. Um, what else? One was chewing on a trim horse hoof when I got there. I mean, they were truly farms. There's goats around, there's horses. They're out with everything. But mom, since she was exposed to that, they probably have a pretty good load of antibodies, right? The puppies do, because they've been out there in the wild, in a sense. So they, we'll get into that, but it's very controversial. Okay, another thing I want to talk about before I ask any questions. <coughs> Is you know I, I'm not fixated on these pizzles, but I'm learning a lot. And then since I'm learning a lot, I like to pass it on to you guys. Uh, you know I told you these are made from human food grade bull penises. Some might even be a steer penis. You know if you're not familiar with cattle steers are castrated bull, they still have a penis, but it probably wouldn't be quite the diameter of a bull's penis. But I found out yesterday that sometimes, you know, and I thought they were also, another name that was equal was a bully stick. But I ran into some companies last night on the web that they were calling something else a bully stick. And I, they said tendon, a beef tendon. I don't know if that's their code word for a penis. <laughs> you know what I mean? They maybe like, they'll think a housewife will reject this totally if we call it a penis. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it was confusing because they said tendon, beef tendon, and so it got me a little scared. And they were coming from South America. That's not terrible. You know, there's some good beef down there. But remember, I, 
I feel really responsible when I give this to an animal. So this is human food grade bull penis that's shipped around the world to make penis soup, bull penis soup, people eat it. So I like that idea because it's inspected as if it's a T-bone steak, right? It's not like carted off to some rendering or some truck that's unsanitary. Um, so I feel good about it and I've called the company in Baltimore that does the processing. They hang these things up because there's usually a curve in it. They smoke them for about 72 hours at 170 degrees. I mean, it's basically all dehydrated. Most companies will say it's 100% digestible, no chemical added. I don't want to downplay these things, but you don't know how they're processed. So, yeah. Question. So, do you buy those online, or where do you? These things, yeah. I can I can show you like tomorrow uh, a picture of. Just want to make sure this is going good. Um, I'm going to get that little, see I always carry a needle holder that is a scissor on it. I'm going to give it right back to you. Um, yeah, online you can, but I have my business office right over there. Yeah, uh, order them directly. I just want to get some of this loose stuff off. Because the other thing is whenever you give a dog a treat, ideally you're kind of present in case something pulls off and they get, they're choking. Um, I just there's some I knew this end was going to be eaten first. It's got it's probably just connective <coughs> tissue. Here it is. Now look at. Pretty popular. Okay. So now I'm ready for. There's a whole bunch of stuff on my list, but let's see if there's any burning questions from the past assessment since we didn't have Monday. Um, and I, I should tell you, let me tell you how those are made because there's like a duplicate, uh, like two questions were the same, and then I think one question had two same answers. So let me tell you how they're constructed, then you won't feel like I'm uh, not a very good editor or something. I have this big computer program. The quizzes, the assessments start out anywhere between 50 and 100 questions. I have to pare it down to like 25, 26, or 27, right? I'm going to show you how those are graded too. I've got that sheet here. So I've got that many questions. I never see them at one time on one screen. And then I go through, and there's like, think of a little toggle switch by each question. I say use or not use. <coughs> and then the program is so good that if I get 26 that are used, then it just prints out 26 out of the 100 that are in the barrel. So it's a very complex program, and then late at night, you don't see them all, so I might have, I don't realize there's two duplicates, right? Because sometimes there's a way to mesh past quizzes and assessments. Uh, so it's kind of like, there's so many questions that it's not gonna be, it's not purposely done, like if it's a question you can't get the answer for, I don't mean to have you get it tough, wrong twice. But here's the other thing, I, I always pay for my mistakes, you never do. So that's why those extra questions are there. So it's kind of like if I goofed up and the question came from out of the world and you don't know where it was, I'll just say, well, think of it as the extra one I gave you. Otherwise, I would just have it 25 questions. But the first one we had 26, so that's one extra. Last time, this last Thursday, we had two extra. That's three extra questions. That's six extra points already. Uh, and somebody in the grade book have over, some people have over 100% right now. So let me, while I'm talking about that, let me show you this little card I have on the document cam, and then I'll see if there's any questions on the assessment. So remember, you're supposed to take the number correct and multiply it by two. So in my case, I have a little card here that if, after I grade a person's thing, if they have zero, this is last week, Zero wrong is 54. See how you'd get it? They'd have 27 correct times two is 54. That's how I do it, okay? The range was, um, I think the low was 24, and then the high was 54. I didn't tally up how many got each, but there's a lot of in here. Okay, comments, questions on the assessment or anything up to this point? Endocrinology, videos, 
online quizzes. I know some people are taking online quizzes. Okay. So let me, oops, sorry, no, it's that. That's this thing here. Let me go here. Let me go to this question because it's a good one. And then I'm going to do this table next. Okay? Okay, so here's the question. And it's a little small for you guys. And too bad they have the, the magnifier under where the question is. But anyway, okay. So I would write this down in your notes and then, you know, remember. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and then we're going to do some math questions, too. The first two assessments have been pretty straightforward. The endocrine stuff, because it's kind of complicated, always decreases the average of the class, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, here's some question from Alexis. Are atrial peptin and angiotensinogen hormonal antagonists? Excellent question. Because let me do this first. Let me explain hormonal antagonists. <coughs> Ignoring the other words. If two hormones are antagonists, what one does, the other one does the opposite. That's antagonism. And I've got my little timer over here. I'll remember. Audrey, remind me at noon, will you, to go click my camera? So it's like, uh, or good cop, bad cop, right? But one does, the other one does again. So that's antagonism. One pulls this way, the other one pulls that way. So there are hormones that are released that increase something, and then there's something else that decreases it. And so you tend to have a balance. The body has a balance. And so that's hormonal antagonists, but you can even think of antagonism, that's separate also, but hormonal antagonists, something else. So then atrial peptin, if you've done this reading or the videos already, you know this is a hormone from the heart. So the heart is an endocrine gland. I mean, it's pumping blood, yes, that's its main function. And we'll fill out a table of, of atrial peptin. Um, atrial peptin is a real good name. Sometimes, that's the frustrating thing, our ancestors. Sometimes the hormone names are like right on, and sometimes it's like it doesn't give you a clue. Atrial peptin is perfect. Atrial refers to the atrium of the heart. And peptin means it's a small amino acid uh, built structure. So therefore it's a protein hormone, okay? So the heart releases this protein hormone here we go. You can do the laser trick. Okay, there we go. Here, okay. In the back of the room. See, I can control a dog with a laser. Okay. So the heart is an endocrine gland. It makes horm a hormone, this one here. Now, so here's what atrial peptin does. We've got to talk about function, right? This is physiology. The heart releases this hormone when it senses too much blood volume. Too much blood volume, the heart goes, uh, you guys, I need to like have less blood coming in. So it releases atrial peptin. And basically it goes to the kidney and says, make more urine because urine comes directly from blood, it's filtered. So the kidney says, okay heart, I will make more urine. And it decreases blood volume. What's neat about the kidney, if it was allowed to do everything it wanted, you, we'd all dehydrate, we, you know, like two hours we'd be dead because it wants to get rid of that much water. There's some mechanism that it does. So, angiotensinogen, <laughs> We're feeling our easy. Uh, feeling our oats. Angiotensinogen technically is not a hormone. Therefore, a short answer to this is no. These are not antagonistic hormones because one is not a hormone. But I've seen textbooks call angiotensinogen a hormone. So that's another thing. That's maybe what this person ran into, or it's in one of the readings. I don't know. But it's technically not a hormone. But if it's an antagonistic substance, 
atrial peptin says make more urine, so then this stuff should say make less urine. And in a sense, it's involved with making less urine. So I, it's a really great question. And I've got a little diagram on this. So terrific question, because it's showing the right process, but angiotensinogen tends not to be a hormone, and I'll show you. Okay, now here's the thing. Remember how I'm kind of promoting you make these pages on the tone system? And if you have a page that's called liver on top, remember one of the things would be makes red blood cells in the fetus, makes albumin, makes angiotensinogen. The liver makes angiotensinogen. Okay. So let me show you the diagram I found. <laughs> that kind of explain, and it's good, and it's not in the videos or anything. Hey, what are you doing? Ruth? Okay, here we are, uh, and I'm right here. <coughs> hey, where's your toy? <coughs> oh, here it is, right over here. Not toy, tree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is perfect. It's called the Renin Angiotensin System. Part one, the kidney sends a decrease in blood pressure. That's a decrease in blood volume. And remember how the heart released it when it was increased blood volume. So they're antagonistic in a sense, okay? So when the kidney sends a decrease in blood pressure, it releases renin. So the kidney is releasing renin. And notice there's only one end in the middle. Anybody know if it was R-E-N-N-I-N? -N -N? What's that, Renin? R-E-N-N-I-N, -N -N, a little sidebar. This is R-E-N-I-N, -N, but I'm talking about R-E-N-N-I-N. -N -N. Anybody? Isn't it involved in like cattle or... Um, it curdles milk in young calves. Yeah, renin is an enzyme that kind of curdles milk, so the young calf has more time to digest the milk rather than <coughs> go through the system. Okay, so renin is an enzyme. So that's another thing, not a hormone. You know what I mean, how confusing this can be? And then pro probably later today or tomorrow, we'll talk about like how do you kind of tell what a hormone, you know, is a hormone, substance is a hormone. So renin is an enzyme, and that means it takes a substrate and converts it into a product, right? That's the hallmark of an enzyme. It's in the middle, it catalyzes that reaction. So in this system, we better see a substrate going to some product. And how? what helps it? Renin is an enzyme. So it's released into the blood. I, I mean, look at this diagram, it's so good. Look at, they got low blood pressure. Look at, they got the kidney there. And you know what, that diagram is very true. Because what, there's a artery, there's vein, and that's the ureter that carries urine to the bladder. Okay, so you release renin, and here it is. Renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. So this is happening in the blood now, right? Renin is released from the kidney, goes in the blood. Angiotensin is always around. It's made by the liver. We're all making angiotensin, angiotensinogen right now. But it's inactive in the blood. Why is it inactive? <coughs> because it's not converted yet. It's only active when renin is released. So it's there, it's ready to do it. So it converts it to, uh, here in this diagram, A1, and then we've got ACE converting it to A2, and look at A2 is bigger, I mean, this is a really a nice diagram. It's bigger and it's gonna do more function. I mean, the more I look at that diagram, that's kind of neat. ACE is angiotensin converting enzyme, that's written up here. Look at, it's in the lungs. So look at the system we have. Renin is released when it senses low blood pressure, basically low blood volume. Angiotensinogen is floating around in the blood. 
and then it converts it to angiotensin 1. And then, as that blood goes through the lungs, it, could have, it contains ACE, and then ACE is converted to angiotensin 2. That's a really good diagram, okay? Now, angiotensin is really a good name up here, too, because angio is a prefix meaning vessel. And tensin means like tension. So angiotensin 2 makes all the blood vessels shrink, decrease diameter. If you have low blood volume, low blood pressure, and you make all the pipes smaller, will that increase pressure? Yeah, it does. It increases blood pressure. So they're kind of, I mean, that was a great question, Alexis. It was just that. Angiotensinogen isn't a hormone, so it wasn't really, they're not perfect hormonal an antagonists, but they do opposite things. Okay, so I'm going to come back here and do my camera little trick. Am I being followed? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I yes, you're good, you're good. Now, Rachel, where does Rue live? With you? Um, she's actually in the front store. Okay. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so anybody have any questions on that? Yes. Yeah. You said angiotensin 2 does what again? It causes blood vessels to decrease their diameter. And that automatically increases blood pressure. If you go like this, that's a, that is a nice diagram. And the thing is, you know, I can't get Chrome started on the computer. I got to call ITAP. This is through uh, Bing search. I never used Bing, but I also used Google, but it just happened to be that way. But I mean, look at the, it's stunning how they, the person drew this and knew, okay, this guy's not going to do a lot because he's going to get converted into ACE, and then ACE does the job. And the kidney is shooting out, and then this JGA is a certain area in the kidney. It's not a super big deal, but we'll run into that name. Well, there's a name, but we'll do that some other time. Okay. Now let's go to this hormone table. Okay, yes, question. Sorry, um, yeah, no. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but if you want to say, like, evolutionary, like, why would they, in the evolution, have it so that it easily converted again into the correct form? Why wouldn't it just go straight from right into the correct form? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know the, the answer yeah. to that. Yeah, that's a good question. Why is it a two-step process rather than a one-step process, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, and that's, here's, that's the thing about physiology or science in general. It's hard to answer why questions, right? Why don't we have gills and living water? You know what I mean? It's easier to explain what this happened. Sorry, did you say angiotensin 1 is converted into ACE? And then no, no, no. ACE is an enzyme that's in the lungs. ACE converts angiotensin 1 to 2. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. So ACE is another enzyme in the process. Renin is an enzyme that does, does that first step. And then ACE is the second enzyme in that string. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let me focus on this a little bit. I don't know why that doesn't look really focused. Um, <coughs> Okay, well here's that hormone table that's on the reading thing, this week's reading endocrinology over there. Okay, so let me explain it, and actually it's kind of funny, I, maybe the person, Alexis, was reading this and then did that. Okay, so this first call, what is the source of the hormone? Sources can be a gland you can pick out, like an ovary. You can pick out an ovary and show people an ovary. I can bring an ovary. I've got all kinds of ovaries in my office. It could be a tissue. That's hard to dissect out. It could be just a layer of tissue someplace. I'm saying, who can make hormones? It's not always a gland that you can cut out like an ectomy, you know. Uh, or it can be just a few cells dispersed in someplace else, in the tissue that's making a hormone. So hormones come from cells. They're produced by, we'll find out, you know, different stimuli. So that's this column. And in this case, we talked about the heart and then the atria. 
So that they, that's a good example. There are just some cells dispersed in the heart muscle that make this hormone. You can't cut out a gland. You can't go to some spot and cut it out and say, all the atriopeptin is gone. No, it's dispersed. So then the next <coughs> one says, what hormone is made by this gland? And we're doing atrial peptide. It's a peptide, uh, sometimes abbreviated AMF. Now, this column means stimulus for release. Why did the tissue release this hormone? And in this case, increased blood volume, okay? Then, this is a great term that most people use, target tissue. That means when the hormone's released, and a hormone always, and I'll say for right now, in most cases, always goes to the blood and gets spread all over, okay? It doesn't know where it's going. It's a, it's a, where it goes is dictated by blood flow. And that's another thing. Maybe an organ doesn't have enough blood flow, then it doesn't get enough hormonal stimulation. It's complicated. But wherever it goes, it kind of like, it's like if you were lost, and you were in Lily Hall and looking in all the doors, and there'd only be one that you were really attracted to or wanted to go into, and that would be the target room. Say you were looking for a room with a puppy, that's this room. There's no, probably no other room that has a puppy today in this building. So the target tissue has receptors for the hormone. And it's just like a key. The key is the hormone, and you could fit it in all lily doors, and there's only one that it fits and turns. That's the target tissue. No other tissue is the target. Okay? It's only where the key fits into a lock and turns. Now here it is. If the key fits into the lock, but doesn't turn, that's what Eli Lilly does. Drugs do that. They fit into receptors, but they don't do anything. But if you've got something blocking the receptor, then the hormone can't work. The real hormone can't work. <laughs> That's what people down with Eli Lilly do all day. They're looking for things that fit into receptor and then doesn't turn the key. So then the response of the target tissue says, what does this tissue do when that hormone gets there? And here's a term, diuretic. Okay, I'm getting ready to go. Uh, a diuretic says to the kidney, make more urine. What would you use if you want to tell the kidney to make less urine? Anti-diuretic. Diuretic, anti-diuretic. So, let's do another hormone. Now, some are not as clear as this, I'll have to say, like sometimes, it's foggy what causes a release of a hormone, okay? Sometimes it's hard to say something. Okay, but let's do, let's do testosterone. So you'd write testosterone in here. Hopefully from the videos you know, testosterone is a steroid hormone. And that's a nice little sidebar. Oops, I slipped on the penis, I'm sorry. <laughs> This is being recorded too. I mean, people in England are going, what's that guy doing? Sounds like fun though. No, I mean. <laughs> um, in a little sidebar, you should say, what's the difference between a protein hormone and a steroid hormone? And those two up there are great examples. Atrial peptin is a protein hormone made of amino acids, and testosterone that we're going to do is a steroid hormone. Here's the neat thing about it. Some protein hormones, when they're taken out of some animal, don't work in another species. Like human insulin might not work very well in a cow. Why? Because protein hormones are made by putting amino acids together, strings of them, and not all species makes insulin the same way. It's insulin for that species, but I can, I bet you someplace out there, there's some insulin you can take from a pancreas of a, let's say, tiger, and it won't work in a man or something, okay? We're on the Okay, 
Rachel maybe go pick up that dog. Uh, no, that's fine. Okay, so protein hormones vary across the species, around the world. But here's the kicker with uh, steroid hormones. Steroid hormones are the same around the whole world. Amazing. So in Africa right now, there's a bull elephant chasing something. He's got testosterone in his blood. Everybody in this room has testosterone in their blood too, even the females, right? And our testosterone looks exactly like his testosterone. So we could take his testosterone and it would fit in our testosterone receptors. If we took his insulin, I'm not sure if it would fit in our receptors. See the difference there? So that's something <coughs> very fundamental. But steroids are all the same the world around. And everybody knows what molecule do you start with before you make any steroid? It's like, it's like the square clay before you make a pot. I'm not a potter, but doesn't it come in square? What's the square that's made into any pot, into any steroid? Here we go. Uh, pregnenolone. Well, pregnenolone, yes, that's good. But I was, and I want to just go back one, okay. cholesterol. Yeah, you know, and it's a whole big pathway but pregnenolone is, yes, good, and cholesterol. Okay, so now, remember on that table, or the, on that page, we said liver up on top. Makes cholesterol. The liver makes cholesterol. See how we get one of those sheets that says liver on top? It have quite a little range. It's amazing. Okay, so then let's do testosterone on this table. Anyway, and just make a little interesting story. Some of you are um, are familiar with it's linked, right? LinkedIn, where somebody endorses somebody, right? Have you ever seen that? Yeah. One of my past colleagues that I knew from North Carolina State last year, about this time, he endorsed me for testosterone. I thought that was kind of sweet. I don't know what that means, but you know, endorse for testosterone, really? Anyway, here we go. Testosterone. Uh, okay, so testosterone is here, right? What makes testosterone? For right now, let's make it pretty elusive and say gonads. G-O-N-A-D-S. Now here's the kicker. There are sometimes multiple places the same hormone is made. Okay, I'm not going to get that complicated right, complicated right now, but... Let's do gonads. Of course, gonads are ovaries or testes, right? Testosterone, stimulus for release. It's complicated fast. LH from the anterior pituitary gland. For right now, and then you guys can look up LH. It's capital L, capital H. It's called luteinizing hormone. You can find, find it someplace. Luteinizing hormone comes from the anterior pituitary is released into the blood, travels all over the body, but there's only receptors for LH in the gonads. Certain cells, and they're gonna make testosterone. Uh, target tissue, well, in this case, it's also interesting. There might be multiple target tissues. <laughs> we'll do one. Accessory sex glands in the male. And that's the glands that make the fluid portion of semen. You know, semen is basically sperm cells and then fluid, a lot of fluid. And the fluid is made by these cell, these glands called accessory sex glands, the most famous one of which is the prostate. You watch TV and they talk about benign prostatic hypertrophy you can get drugs that decrease the size of the prostate because it's a dangerous thing because the prostate, if this is the urethra in the male, the prostate is around it completely and if it enlarges, it decreases the size, the diameter of the lumen in the urethra and some people can't urinate. Okay, so the target tissue are accessory sex glands and the response make fluid, or you want to get technical, make seminal fluid. 
So that's an interesting thing with testosterone because let's do a steer and a bull. A bull has testes, right? Making testosterone. So his accessory sex glands are very functional. As big as there ever, ever will be, bull. A steer the same size beside him would have very small accessory sex glands. Why? No testosterone. Right, the steer is castrated. He technically has another tissue that makes testosterone, but I won't go there right now. But a steer has no, you know, very low testosterone, and all the accessory sex glands are very small. So if you ever want to dissect some animal and you want to take out beautiful accessory sex glands, and I've done this like with a boar, then you use an intact male because the accessory sex glands are going to be as full as they'll ever be. Don't use a castrated animal because they actually, the glands shrink up without the testosterone. Very interesting. Okay, so now, anybody else have any questions on that? Let's see, let me start just a couple minutes of hormone receptors, okay? Or hormone action, let's take those two okay. okay. Hormone action. We'll get some nice pictures, and I guess you guys can uh, Google as well these things. Remember, this is our textbook. Hey, you this want to is a, oh, sorry. Yeah. Always keep me on track here. Okay. Okay, here we go. Warm up, warm up. Here it is. Okay, so I did hormone action. And it does the same thing. There's some cell that secretes it. It goes in through the interstitial space by diffusion. The hormone is green in this case. It enters the bloodstream and it's going to get carried away by the blood, right? There's the hormone. There's a blood vessel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so along the way, the hormone is going to diffuse out of capillaries. Remember capillaries are leaky? It's not going to diffuse out of the aorta. I've got to bring the horse aorta tomorrow. It's like an incredible thing. It's going to diffuse out of the blood vessels in the capillaries. And it's like the key. And if the key fits into the receptor, then this cell does something. It fits in and turns. <laughs> So the target tissue, the target cell. And then this might make something and release it into the blood again, okay? Well, you know, they, they show two target tissues. But that's the whole action of hormone function. Hormone travels through the whole body, fits into a receptor, but it's gotta turn. If it doesn't turn, then you block the action of the native hormone. And there's a, pharmaceutical companies do this all day. What binds to the receptor but doesn't cause any post-receptor events. Tomorrow I'm going to start out, who, what TA is here tomorrow? Okay, you guys, remind me to do hormone half-life to start with. Here we go. Autocrine or paracrine, uh, testosterone, in most cases, it's endocrine. Thank you.